with the Hindu American community in the greater Washington area, as well as with the Indian diaspora nationally and globally. She was invited to the youth panelists at 2019 Pravasi Bharatiya Conference hosted by the Indian national government. And she works with the Indian government on matters affecting the Indian youth diaspora. She's going to be talking about the developing, um, sorry, the, how Hindu philosophy helps, helps you know, one lead a, a, a holistic life. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to conclude this panel with the youth, you know, who will be giving, after all the elders have talked about in terms of what it is, as to what she is going to be talking about this. Welcome. I guess I'll have to talk like this. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Okay, namaste everyone. Um, before I really dive into my talk, I just want to extend my deepest vote of thanks and gratitude to Dilip Ji, Sant Ji, um, and the amazing sponsors of this very, very cool and very timely event. And I, will, I want to also thank all of you for spending your Saturday afternoon uh, engaging with us in enlightening discussion. Uh, today I'm going to take a slightly different angle and I'm going to talk about my own personal story um, as the child of immigrants, as someone born and raised in the United States, uh, a young Hindu American, and sort of my own journey and how I came to discover my identity. Before I start though, I have to let you know that I'm really not used to talking about my faith uh, in such a public forum. It's only been in recent times, actually, that I've been asked to come and speak about uh, my identity and my own path. So thank you once again for this opportunity. So as I was preparing for today and as I was reflecting on my life, I thought about all of the challenges, successes, trials and tribulations, rewards, pains and heartbreaks that I went through to be able to sit before all of you here today and say three very simple but deep words. And they are the following. I'm a Hindu. Now I'm sure these words may seem very simple, but for me they're actually dripping with significance. I say these words to all of you today with conviction, but there was a time in my life not too long ago when I was actually deeply insecure and ashamed to call myself a Hindu. Now maybe I can trace the source of this shame to my world history class in high school when we were supposed to give presentations on the major world religions and I saw the group that was assigned to Hinduism make a complete mockery and foolery of my faith. Maybe I can trace it back to the same class when my teacher was insisting that I fit my Hindu religion within a Judeo-Christian paradigm of this is my one God, these are my prophets, this is my holy book, and these are my commandments. Maybe I can trace the source of my shame to a time in elementary school when a little girl kept asking me, why do you guys pray to zillions of gods? Or maybe, I can trace my shame to a time again in high school when I went over to a friend's house and her dad kept asking me, how come you don't eat beef? Are you afraid something is going to happen to you? During this period of my adolescence and of being a teenager in America, I just really didn't have the answers to these questions. I didn't know how to defend myself and I didn't know where the answers to these questions lied. At the age of 17, I had just finished high school. I was a good student, I was a high achiever, I was on my way to college, and by every definition I would say I was a successful teenager. But inside I was extremely lost. I don't think I was any different from other 17-year-olds in this country who are also the child of immigrants. 
because I was facing the same challenge that many of us face, and that challenge is finding your identity in a country that is as racially diverse and eclectic as America. The reality is that even though our communities contain so much knowledge, theoretically and intellectually, sometimes there is a gap in translating that to young people. And when you're a young person who's being asked difficult questions or embracing the rigors of a challenging academic life, sometimes you don't really know where to turn. So at 17, I decided I was going to go straight to the source. I was going to stop being insecure. You see, at 25, I thought I was living my best life. I was a newly licensed attorney. I was working long hours in a prestigious law firm, hard hours, making my billable requirements, working with tough clients, tackling challenging cases. But for some reason, despite having accumulated such a reservoir of knowledge, I was still deeply restless inside and I couldn't figure out why. That's when it hit me that I had spent this entire time accumulating knowledge, but I had never actually had the chance yet to be tested. Faith is experienced. As much as we turn to books, as much as we intellectualize and theoreticize, it doesn't really touch you until it touches your heartstrings. I realized that despite having spent my early 20s and mid-20s exploring my religion, I was still living my life according to very, very core Western principles that I think we're all raised with from day one. The first is climb up the ladder and get to the top. The second is be unique, stand out, be special, don't blend into the crowd. And the third is, save the world. Use your American privilege and education and save the world. What I didn't know at 25, and I'm now 29, so it's really not that long ago, but a lot has changed since then. And what I didn't know at 25 was that I was about to experience my faith through one of the most unexpected of ways through my calling, and through my chosen profession, through being a lawyer and an advocate. At that point, I decided to stop focusing on all of the internal disturbance within me and this time focus on my environment outside. I started paying attention to the racial and gender dynamics in my workplaces of being one of the few minority women of color working in a profession that has historically and traditionally been dominated by Caucasian men. I paid more attention to the politics, to the drama of the legal environments I was in. I paid attention to the status quo in our society. I paid attention to what our politicians were saying. I started making my voice more prominent on issues that I felt very passionately about. And I started taking on pro bono cases. I was working with refugees from Myanmar and Eritrea, helping, res helping to resettle them into the United States. And I represented a disabled child before the Social Security Administration getting his benefits. Throughout these years, I've worked in a multitude of different environments. I've worked in the human rights sector with the United Nations in Africa. I've worked in the federal government. I've worked as a corporate lawyer in a law firm. I've worked at an NGO. And through my work experiences, I've now come to realize something. I still live my life according to those American principles I outlined you, to you before. But the difference this time is that I practice them through my Hindu faith. So now for me, climb up the ladder and kill yourself to get to the top has become enjoy living out my life's purpose. 
For those of us who are high achievers and who, are, and who want to be somewhere high in our careers, we're often miserable because we root our sense of self-worth in external validation. I remember times when I would work so hard on a case or on a matter, and when I didn't receive the desired outcome, I was crushed. Why didn't the partner say anything to me? Why didn't my client say anything? Why didn't I get that raise? Why didn't I get that promotion? At times, this negative thinking would suck out the entire fun and joy of being a lawyer. And despite what many lawyers will tell you, it's actually a quite fun profession, and I do enjoy it. In fact, I went to law school so I could challenge myself. I love to write, I love to read, I love to think about social issues. I have an idealized vision of the world and I want to be a part of changing it and being a voice for marginalized people. That's why I went to law school. Once I realized why I had done this in the first place, I realized that this wasn't a job for me. It was my calling, it was one of my life purposes. And when you discover purpose in your work, you develop a sense of gratitude. You're thankful to God, actually, because he's given you a chance now to shine and to show off your skills and talents for something that's higher than just pleasing a person or a company. And when you have this gratitude, your purpose actually becomes your duty in the dharmic and Hindu sense. Not in the sense of, oh my gosh, I now owe this to somebody, but in the sense of, I want to do this for you, God, as thanks for the cognitive faculties, for the opportunities, for the privilege, and for the blessings that you have given me. Now I put my entire heart and soul into something, and I automatically have a sense of detachment. Sometimes the outcomes are even better than I'd hoped, and when they're not, I have the strength to move on faster. For I know that the result lies in a higher power's hands, and I know that if it didn't go my way, there must be a reason for it. And I know now, I'm not working for a boss who sits in an office chair, but for the biggest boss of them all. Be unique, stand out, be different, has now just become for me, be myself. The truth is that divinity exists in all of us. There is a light in every single one of us. No two people are created the same. And if you stop containing that light and suffocating it and you actually allow it to shine, you will always stand out because there's no one else like you on this planet. I had to learn about this principle also through some tough moments in my work environments. I'll never forget when a female colleague approached me and told me women shouldn't wear bright colors in the workplace because it ruins our chances of getting a promotion. And I scratched my head as I thought about this. First of all, who made this rule up? Second of all, as a woman, I love bright colors just like any other girl. And third, how do I fit this within my Hindu identity and within my own complex sense of self? I mean, putting aside just holy, think about how colorful our culture is. From our dresses, to our food, to our classical Indian dances, to our bhajans, to our mythology, to our art. I can go on and on and on. So in a small act of defiance, I decided to come to work wearing a beautiful silk scarf that I bought from my trip to Varanasi over my business suit. And it actually accessorized it quite well. That's when I realized I don't have to subsume my Hindu identity or my sense of self under a Western misogynistic and sexist notion of how women ought to behave in the workplace. Moreover, I am incredibly blessed to come from a culture and a religion which acknowledges the fact that color is a fundamental part of human existence. We are born to express, we are born to emote, not to be rote and robotic. 
I don't need someone to embrace, we don't need someone to embrace the bindi to make it cool, to embrace yoga to make it cool, to embrace vegetarianism or veganism to make it cool before we decide to reclaim it and make it cool on our own. I remember a time when I used to be very embarrassed when my mom would come to pick me up from school, sometimes wearing a bindi. And then a couple years later, Hollywood embraced this as a fashion statement. Now it's not that unusual to see women wearing bindis down the street. Maybe my small act of defiance that day was a bit weird, but maybe what I did is going to open the doors for millions of other men and women from different religions and ethnic cultures to wear pieces of their own ethnic garb and jewelry in the workplace and normalize these standards across corporate America. Finally, save the world, save everyone, and use my American privilege to save the world has now just become for me Manava Seva Madhava Seva. In service to humanity lies service to God. Across my different experiences from working in Africa to working in India, I've really been honored and blessed to work with impoverished communities, to work on policies which affect mass level change, and to really see my work do some good for the betterment of society at large. But surprisingly, I've also come across a couple of lawyers and people during these times who, despite doing amazing work on a global level, are actually quite terrible in their personal lives. I remember when I first discovered this and I was really shocked. That's when, it occurred, that's when two things occurred to me. First, I realized that there are two types of compassion in this world. There's global compassion, which is easy enough, right? We don't want world hunger. We want world peace. Nobody wants orphans or animal cruelty. But there's also personal compassion, and that's a lot harder to practice. That's the practice of just being a good person by virtue of your character, of your daily tasks, in the way you treat people day to day to day. I also realize that if we take a look at the Hindu definition of humanity, or at least the way I saw it, we acknowledge as Hindus that the divine exists in all of us. Thus I thought to myself, doesn't humanity, can't humanity, exist all in one person, in one creature, even in one plant? Must I really be saving the entire world to be effective as a human being? I looked at myself inwardly, and I asked myself, what about myself? Am I preserving the humanity in me? Am I being as empathetic of a person as I can be? Am I being an ear to my colleagues when they need to vent out a tough day? Am I doing what I can to be an effective leader and manage junior associates and make people's lives immediately around me better when we're already dealing with so much stress anyway? And I realized, in order to be an effective advocate, you have to empathize with human suffering on a one-on-one -on -one level and get down to that granular level of humanity. Whether that means listening to my client cry for hours as she tells me about the domestic abuse she has endured, or whether that means knowing how to navigate the politics of my workplace in a method where I remain true to my own character. And that's when I realized that as a Hindu, if I save my world and I save someone else's world, I have saved the whole world. This year, I was incredibly fortunate to attend my first Kumbh Mela in Varanasi. And as I was bathing in Ma Gange, I couldn't help but think about how far I had come from being this insecure teenager without answers to being this woman before all of you here today. I like to think that when I continue to navigate this 
intensely challenging socio-political climate that we're in, when I navigate the rigors of my own work, when I see injustices in our society unfolding around me, I like to think in those moments that a piece of Mangange is still on my skin, that the voices of my forefathers are still resounding from the deepest embers of my heart, guiding me in moments where I need it the most. My closing remarks for all of you are that no matter what age you're at or station or, or period in your life, to trust your struggles. For through your struggles, you will find your own sense, your own sense of truth. And there's nothing more beautiful in this existence than finding truth all on your own. Namaste and thank you. That was, that was terrific, you know, and I, I, most of the people I'm sure will exactly hope that's what their, all their kids will transform you know, in terms of what you have to go through the struggle and then the transformation and um, getting it through your own profession is even more remarkable.